Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mike Foley, vSphere Tech Marketing, and this is another episode of Quick Bytes. And with me is my colleague, Bob Plankers, and Bob works on vSphere Security, the job I used to do. And we were just recording a bunch of these Quick Bytes, and we decided to kind of go in a different direction away from product and more towards just a conversation about some of the things that have been going on in the industry lately and probably the big one we're gonna ch do a few minutes chat about is uh, ransomware especially as it pertains to vSphere and Bob do you want to kick it off uh, do I ever uh, actually I don't uh, ransomware <laughs> yeah no ransomware is Mike you've said this before it's a boogeyman you know it's it's the scary thing and it's driving a lot of security it's driving a lot of good security practices forward a lot of uh, security complacency but uh, it's also very scary you know like and it's entered the mainstream sort of consciousness now because when you can't f when on the east coast if you can't uh east coast of the u.s if you can't fuel your your vehicle because of a ransomware attack that's that's a very real thing it's not this abstract you know yeah. computer nerds do attacking each other sort of thing you know it's a very real thing and you know and the and so thinking about how ransomware attacks happen and what we can do to prevent them uh and uh what we can do to yeah you know like try to try to to curtail this sort of stuff is really important and so if we want to start with how they happen you know there's a lot of reasons for them you know that uh, we can add all the security in the world to our infrastructures and to our applications and to our desktops but eventually somebody has to use them right and uh, the uh, uh, you know we yeah, put, yeah somebody has to install configure and maintain yeah uh, somebody's got to use Excel on uh, the Excel by the way greatest system and tool ever the uh, uh, <laughs> I beg to differ yeah well you know the uh, um, but the eventually somebody's got to use these things these these systems are not there just to be there they're not an end unto themselves. Uh, they're there for the workloads. And what do you do for a workload? Well, you've got all these firewalls around everything. You punch a hole through the work, uh, the firewall to get to the workload, right? To get to the web server or whatever. And so uh, you've got this um, fractal-like security perimeter that's developed in, in a lot of organizations, you know, and it's... And an attacker needs to get lucky once. Defenders have to be on their game at all times. And so what mm -hmm. happens, how this happens, is an attacker gets lucky once. They send a phishing email to somebody and they click on something maybe they shouldn't have. Uh, they, uh, um, they enter their credentials somewhere that probably they shouldn't have. Maybe it was a phishing attack. Maybe something's hanging out on the internet that shouldn't be, you know, and there's a vulnerability. And the uh, and people are not protecting their management interfaces or of their infrastructure well. There's a lot of organizations that it was just all one big happy family, right? We've got one big switch network, one big IP space, whatever, you know. And so, uh, a desktop gets infected, a user account, uh, an Active Directory domain account, gets you know co-opted uh, co by an attacker. And then they just wait. They they find something else. They uh, figure out how to establish persistence in the network. They find a place to hide, basically, and hide. And they probe the network. It's a it's an incredible penetration test. Uh, they do asset management. They'll map all of your assets and what versions they are, all of that stuff. And then uh, if they can find if the attacker can find a way to uh, escalate their privileges, maybe through a, the, a lot of organizations depend very heavily on things like Microsoft Active Directory. They do uh, um, uh, both their authentication, you know, proving that I am Bob, you know, but also authorization that Bob can go log into these things. And when you do that, that makes Active Directory a really big target. And so... Yep. These attackers often look to Active Directory to, to see, you know, is it patched, you know, and, uh, um, you know, can they can they break in? Maybe somebody's got a, a login script with a password sitting in it. You know, there's a lot of that sort of stuff. And they find a way in. And so they create themselves a domain admin account, and then they just add themselves to the vSphere users or vSphere admins group or the firewall admins group or the storage admins group. And then they can just go log into these the storage arrays or vSphere or whatever. And that's that's bad news. And so 
um, being able, adding some separation there, uh, you know, I often compare it to the castles versus prisons. Uh, the uh, we need we've organizations classically have had sort of the castle approach they've got a big moat they've got big walls but once you're inside it's you can go wherever you want right to for the most part uh, yeah i i look i look at it that as the hard candy with the soft inside yep, soft gooey shell or soft gooey interior yeah. there and uh, we need to turn it more into alcatraz where it's got a very distinct moat as well and big walls but it's also got internal controls too you know and so somebody who and, and it's surrounded by a bay full of sharks well that's the big moat yeah you know <laughs> big big bitey moat and uh, uh the uh, um alcatraz is actually the i thought of it the other day and it's the perfect analogy for what we need and and so we need to make sure that there's internal controls and that you know, this concept of zero trust that keeps coming up, uh, it was mentioned in an executive order by the president of the U.S. And uh, people keep talking about it. And it, at its core, it's really about reconsidering what we trust in infrastructure. You know, do we really want to put, do we really want to have vSphere completely dependent on Active Directory? Or do can we do some separations there where uh, where we can help... Uh, detect an attack, detect something that's not supposed to be happening, uh, protect ourselves against it. You know, one a good example of that is don't use, don't use AD groups for authorization. Use an SSO group. So create an SSO group uh, called you know vSphere administrators or just the administrators group in SSO, and take your Active Directory users and put them in there. That way, an attacker has to actually compromise a very specific account in order to get into vSphere. They can't just add themselves to a group and log in, you know? And you might say, hey, Bob, well, they can still get in. Uh, you know, if they know if they know I'm a vSphere admin, they could still get in. I'm like, yeah, but I'll, I'll know the next time that I try to log in that somebody changed my password. Or you can also booby trap your log collection. Uh, things like Log Insight can do. Uh, can you can set alarms on. So if you get a log entry that says Bob changed his password, you know, you can actually call me and say, hey, did you actually change your password? And I can say, yeah, I just did that. And I can, okay, good, you know, and actually check that sort of stuff. We need to build more of that sort of stuff in. We need to, to uh, in, into our system designs, into our implementations. Uh, yeah, you know, so there's a lot of flexibility in the products to be secure. Uh, we just need to make sure that that comes out as we, as customers and everyone builds stuff with these products. So... Uh, you know, you'll hear a lot of customers say, yeah, but I'm compliant. And we all know compliance doesn't mean secure. What, what, what's really, ha right, what's really happening for things like ransomware, and I, I you know, I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable putting the onus on IT and security and so forth, but quite honestly, that's really where it is, is um, a lot of these things are poor practices. Well, yeah. Um, right? right? Like, uh, like, you, you, like you mentioned, um, it's far easier to walk through the front door than it is to hack their way through the back door. I mean, I mean uh, one of the things, that, one of the stories that I would always tell <clears throat> was when I was working back at DEC uh, in, the, in the 90s, and we were no a bunch of us were noticing that the security guards at the front desk really weren't paying attention to what you showed. You're supposed to show your badge to get past sure, your library card. Yeah. 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 And so we came up with a contest who could get through security showing the strangest object. <laughs> and it was the guy who walked through and showed a can of tuna fish <laughs> and got way through. That's awesome. Right. right? So then, then you extrapolate that to, okay, so if my physical security is that weak, what else is weak? So if I can get into the building, I can get on the LAN. Well, if your vCenter and ESX hosts are on the yeah, LAN, uh, yeah, and you haven't patched, well, there's then opportunities it's there. It's really, yeah. really easy for me to yeah. attack. Yep. And so, so it doesn't necessarily mean you physically have to get into a building, but if the practices around around people management are questionable it gets into that soft gooey inside yeah i mean if it 
so it's been 10 years since the the RSA breach. And a couple of weeks ago, a bunch of people who I knew, some who I worked for, uh, posted blog articles now that they're released from their NDA 10 years later about the breach. And really, it was a very interesting phishing attack where once they got into RSA, it was easy to go sideways into other things. Yep. Because there's that trust. We trust that, uh, you know, we trust IP addresses and we need to, uh, um, we need to start pivoting that into trusting identities, you know, and which is hard at the systems level because, uh, you know, your storage array, do you, how do you trust a storage array? You know, does it have its own, is it a person? Does it have its own identity? What's the difference just between that and just trusting its I'll IP? I'll let you have that conversation with the storage guy. Uh, yeah, no, no, thank you. The, I was a storage guy and the, uh, um, but uh, you know, you touch on a couple of things. So patching, uh, you know, removing vulnerabilities, uh, patching is the only way to truly remove a vulnerability. No workarounds, none of that stuff. The workarounds end up, it's kind of like a cast on your arm. Uh, you know, like eventually the cast gets smelly and starts falling apart and you end up, you know, in the computer context, you know, you end up spending more time keeping it together than, than it, you would have if you just patched, if you just, you know, it, the human body is different because it'll heal itself and your infrastructure won't. Right. right. You've got to actually patch it, but patching gets rid of that stuff. And so patching tends to be a people and process thing more than it is a technological problem. Uh, just getting people used to the idea that uh, security patches in the ITIL framework, uh, uh, you know, there's three types of patches. There's standard patches, which are repeatable, documentable, or documented ones, all of that stuff. There's normal patches, which everything falls into, and that goes to the 90-day or 120-day change uh, evaluation thing, uh, which is how attackers get you. And then emergency patches, where the the danger of not doing the from not doing the change is way greater than doing the change. You know the danger from mm -hmm. doing the change, and so security patches should either be standard uh, standard changes or emergency changes. And then thinking about uh, so patching, yeah, patching is a big one. Identity management, you touched on that. Things like identity federation and vSphere seven are uh, really helpful because you can add multi-factor authentication. It's not just username and password anymore, but it's also a token or whatever. And adding and, and, and that and that role is taken away from vCenter mm -hmm. and done by we'll say like a uh, well, more centralized yeah ADFS Active Directory and Active Directory Federation services with more to come and the uh, um, but everything plugs into ADFS it's a great virtualization la layer mm -hmm. for identity and uh, so adding multi-factor authentication and then closing down other back doors you know go around and look at your perimeter take take your virtual flashlight and shine it into these crevices shut off the usb NICs on your ilos and i uh, idrac hardware management controllers those are back doors you know how do people how do people log into those you know is that active directory does that need to be considered as well uh just yeah just walk around and and check stuff you know and uh, Make sure, think... And, and, and pro probably one of the biggest things you could do is to move vCenter and ESX management interfaces onto an isolated, limited access LAN or VLAN. Uh, honestly, that, that has saved the bacon of so many people. Like when we had the big uh, Spectre... Oh, yeah. Uh, not, not Spectre, but the, the big SSL meltdown a couple of years ago. Well, if everything is enclosed on that land, you were okay until you patched. So you talked earlier about, uh, uh, you know, the poor practices. You know, it's just, this is basic security, you know, defense in depth. What you're talking about is not hiding yeah. things. It's adding a layer of security, you know, and uh, uh, it's adding a layer of additional protection should you lose something else temporarily should a vulnerability be discovered in vcenter server which happens you know it's software just like all other os's and stuff out there you know like um you know you've got another layer of protection because you've got uh, perimeter controls you can use the firewall on the the vm or on the vmware products the appliances themselves have firewalls that you can set up and you can start controlling who accesses that stuff and so and this is sort of a kind of a corollary to this too, uh, controlling who's got access to vCenter server itself. Um, 
you know, should you give everyone in your organization access to vCenter server? No, thank you. Please oh, don't. God, no. uh, I talk to organizations all the time that uh, have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that can log into vCenter server. And that is a recipe for disaster when it comes to ransomware and attacks. And, uh, um, you know, limit it. I always ask the question, who is going to get a call in the middle of the night if the system is down? You know, those are the people that should be able to log into vCenter server. Nobody else, you know. And uh, so just as you don't let an app admin walk into your data center and use the console of a server, same with a vCenter server. It's The analogy is, is basically the same. And so really yep. controlling that, turning off back doors, look at your hardware controllers, uh, shut off SSH. There's no need for it anymore. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just another backdoor into ESXi and that it's meant to be a troubleshooting interface. People turn it on. Yeah. It's inexplicable why they turn it on. Uh, it's not a multi-user operating system. It's a purpose built appliance. It's more, it's more like network switch firmware than anything and yeah. uh, shut it down, shut it off and secure your perimeter. And, uh, yeah, and you'll do well return to the basics, defense in depth, especially add add layers add those internal controls we talk about when we talk about alcatraz you know like so that somebody somebody who well and this is the thing we have to assume now that a uh that a a user account in any sort of organization of size a user account in your uh, active directory domain and a desktop are probably compromised if you go with that assumption your response you know how will you prevent them how will you detect an attack f coming from that desktop? You know, the answers to those questions w should lead you to immensely better security. Yep. yep. So, so uh, just, uh, just to wrap up, up uh, I uh, um, this, this conversation brought up, brought up uh, 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 memories, uh, memories of a blog, blog article that I wrote in 2011, 2011 <laughs> after going to yeah. China, China and Israel. Israel. And uh, the blog article is The Palace of Harmonious Virtualization. <laughs> and I talk about how uh, the Great Wall was a, a was an, uh, analogous to today's firewalls. Mm -hmm. And how the Forbidden City is really how you want to get yeah. control of your environment. Because it's not just protecting from the outside, but it was also protecting from the inside. Yep. What happens if somebody actually gets in? You know, it happens. Yeah. It happened to them, too, yeah. clearly, because they built defenses for it, you know? Right, right. And it was a series of gates with controls looking in and out before, and it all based on things like what was your business there? Uh, what rights did you have to get? through a gate, all these other controls. So this stuff's been going on for thousands of years. Um, it's about time we probably start paying attention to history. Well, and you make a good point that those gate controls go both ways. Are you allowed to leave after you do your business too? You know, and that's a really right. important thing. You know, egress controls are really important on networks as well. And so, yeah, no, but yeah. you're right. Uh, the, you know, we can learn a lot from history. We can also learn a lot from other, other disciplines, you know, and, and uh, physical security especially has got a lot of this stuff figured out because they've been practicing it for thousands of years. So. Yep. All right. In that, uh, to wrap it up, I guess I'll just say thanks again for a good conversation, Bob. And uh, we will catch you on the flip side. Excellent. Thanks. All right. All right. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Take care. Take care.